Good morning and welcome to my uh, lecture on partition of India in print media and cinema. So, uh, this is the lecture 3 and earlier we talked about uh, the Indian National Congress, the moderates, the extremists. We have discussed a few uh, British policies and this is going to be a continuation of the different policies and the important a turn of events, the important you know the earmarks in history that uh, add up to and that ultimately lead to the partition of India. So, uh, after talking about the monumental uh, reforms and the Lucknow Pact, we are going to discuss the Rowlatt Act was passed in March 1919 by the Central Legislative Council to control the militant nationalist struggles and as a way of curtailing the liberty of the Indian people. This bill was meant for speedy trial of offences by a special court and had no room for appeal. So, it had its own arbitrary uh, nature inbuilt in the act itself. The Rowlett Act caused a wave of anger across the country among the Indians and it resulted in M. K. Gandhi, uh, you know, announcing his non-cooperation move movement. So, uh, Gandhi had organized the Satyagraha on 14th of February 1919 and he was arrested on 8th of April 1919. On uh, 13th April of the same year, a large peaceful crowd had gathered at an open space known as the Jallianwala Bagh in Amritsar, Punjab in order to protest the arrest of pro-Indian independence leaders uh, Dr. Saifuddin Kichlio and Dr. Satyapal. When people had uh, you know assembled uh, at Jallianwala Bagh uh, and they were peacefully protesting at that spot, Brigadier General Reginald Edward Harry Tyre ordered his soldiers to open fire on the crowd of an unarmed uh, Indian people, a mass of uh, people that were completely without weapons and they were, they had just assembled to protest peacefully. Uh, national leaders uh, condemned the act of General Dyer unequivocally and uh, the responses around Jallianwala Bagh tragedy further polarized both the British and the Indian peoples. So, a, a renowned author such as Rudyard Kipling for example, he legitimizes, he justifies Dyer's act by saying that he was only delivering his duty and shocked to this response made by Kipling, Rabindranath Tagore renounced the knighthood that was conferred on him. In the same way, Gandhiji signed away the Kaisare Hind, the title that was bestowed to him by the British for his service during the Boer War in South Africa. So, the level of casual brutality and the lack of sheer lack of answerability or accountability had stunned the entire nation and they the people of India had come, lost their faith, uh, the general public of India had lost their faith in the intentions of the United Kingdom. Uh, after this, we talk about the Montego Schlem's four reforms that came in 1919. The reforms draw their name from Edwin Samuel Montagu, who was the Secretary of State for India during the later pass of First World War and from the name of Lord Schlemsford, who was the Viceroy of India and who ruled between 1916 and 1921. So, the reforms are also known as Montford reforms, right. So, Montagu's uh, 1917 declaration announced the British government's intention to grant self-government to Indians and Montagu 
promised the gradual development of self-governing institutions in India. Montagu headed a delegation during 1917 and 1918, in which he held his discussions with Viceroy Lord Schlemsford. So, the reforms were uh, delineated in the Montago Schlems Ford report prepared in 1918 and they formed the theoretical basis of the famous Government of India Act in 1919. The primary proposal in the report was that control of some areas of provincial governance be transferred to the Indian ministers who would be accountable to an Indian electorate. And the key features of this report included increasing association of Indians in every branch of administration, so a further opportunity to become visible within the political arena and then gradual development of self-governing institutions with a progressive realization of responsible government in India as an integral part of the British Empire. Then the reforms would also refer to end of benevolent despotism and introduction of responsible government in India. It referred to a decentralized yet unitary system of government uh, which was proposed based on a steady decentralization of authority and the loss of central government's supremacy. The reforms, the Montego Schlems Ford reforms bestowed partial responsibility to Indians in the provinces. The Indian Legislative Council at the centre was replaced by what was called as the bicameral system. A bicameral system comprising A, the Council of a State and B, Legislative Assembly. So, the principle of separate communal electorates were further being extended for the Sikhs, the Christians and the Anglo-Indians in addition to the Muslims. We see that the monumental reforms was just the beginning which actually set a trend and now what the Muslim had demanded for a separate electorate was also being voiced by the other communities such as the Sikhs, the Christians and the Anglo-Indians. Indians were now being labelled in terms of their communal identification and this is a crucial point in divisive politics, you know, in order to fill seats in the lower and higher houses. If we look at the compo composition, uh, we will see all these divisions and this is how an Indian self perception would develop. We would have these uh, words in our common parlance, this is a legacy that these reforms actually leave to the modern day Indians. We talk, we still talk of general seats in any post, for any post we talk like this and it had started back in 1900 and uh, at the beginning of 20th century actually with more limited reforms. So, the central legislative assembly having 52 general seats and then 30 Muslim seats, 2 Sikh seats, 20 special seats. And then uh, the council of the state had 20 general seats uh, and 10 Muslim seats, 3 European seats and 1 Sikh seat. So, an Indian would not be only an Indian anymore. With Montego Schlem's Ford reforms, there was a diarchy or rule of two classes of administrations, the executive councillors comprising bureaucrats and the legislative councillors comprising ministers. So, the size of the provincial legislative assemblies was increased. Now, about 70 percent of the members were elected. There would be direct elections of members, but restricted franchisee. Some women would also vote. So, there were certain good things about these reforms too. Women were coming out to vote. That had never happened before. Legislators enjoyed their freedom of speech that was also positive. The governor general and his executive council were deemed supreme. The governor's assent was required to pass any bill. So, the central government 
contained executive body, the chief executive authority was the governor general or viceroy. Right? So, the administration was divided into two lists basically, the central and the provincial. Out of eight members of the viceroy's executive council, there would be three Indians. Right. So, definitely the INC had been able to push, uh, I mean they were having, they, their stake was increasing, they were stakeholders in the larger scheme and more and more so. But there were also compromises that were being made, the self perception of the Indian was changing, they were no longer just Indians, but we will see with Pune pact with, with the further reforms and policies, the uh, divisions in terms of one's uh, you know caste, one's communal belonging keeps coming back again and again. So, it Montego Schlem's for reforms created an office of high commissioner of India to act as the agent of governor general of India in London. So, the supreme control was of course, not being bestowed to the Indians, it was still with the Britishers, just that the Indians had an increased representation in the government. The act provided for the first time the establishment of public service commission in India, which was a very positive sign. So, Indians were gaining more agency within the polity. For the first time, the elections created a political consciousness among the people and some Indian women also had the right to vote. It was suggested that the yearly percentage of recruitment made in India be increased by 1.5 percent. This was also a positive change. Finance on the other hand would remain a reserved issue under the supervision of the executive councillor. So, finance would be controlled by the executive. Uh, councillor as a result due to a shortage of funding, Indian ministers were unable to perform much work in the area of local self government. So, although there were representations in some, uh, some exclusive matters, the British would hold on to their own control. So, the question of self government at the localized level uh, would not be uh, very strongly functional. The, the, the question of, of autonomy was still a distant cry, it was still uh, something uh, that remained to be achieved. right? So, the major limitations of Montagu Schlem's four reforms include that it further extended and consolidated communal representation, something that I have already uh, uh, stated again and again. So, next the franchisee was very limited, only those people who had the uh, property taxable income and those who could, uh, who paid high land revenue were entitled to vote. So, here we see an India being etched out through dialogue with the British, which is very elitist by nature. The ones who would vote? someone that could define and who could uh, determine the destiny of uh, a future independent India had to have certain positions. So, the ones th that were paying land revenue that uh, had property taxable income. So, the you know the future enactors and leaders of uh, India were actually emerging from the upper echelons of the society and the voice of the masses remained unheard. Right? The governor general and the governors had a lot of power to undermine the legislature at the center and at the provinces uh, respectively. So, the, uh, the main power was still in the hands of the British like we see the governor general and the governors. The significance of the provinces from the perspective of the British was used to allocate seats for the central assembly rather than referring to the actual population. This was another drawback. 
Further, the Indians were enraged that the British administration assumed sole authority over the nature and timing of the transition of responsibility to the Indians for self-governance. So, although some degree of power was being transferred to the hands of the uh, to the native uh, or the Indian rulers, the British were wary. They were not sure how much of power to transfer to the Indians and they wanted to supervise and control this entire uh, you know transition of responsibility. They wanted to determine how much of power be given to Indians and when the Indians were ready for self-governance. This was seen as an outright insult by the Indians who were actually deemed or perceived as uh, uh, not ready for, uh, for ruling their free country. In the chapters of pre-independence struggles, Salmon Commission, it remains as a black spot. So, the Government of India Act stated that after 10 years, a statutory commission would be set up to study the working of the government and it resulted in the Simon Commission in 1927. The Simon Commission, it was the result of the conservative party led government in the UK, uh, fearing a defeat at the hands of the Labour Party, pre the appointment of a commission in 1928, which was composed entirely of British members. So, it was a commission determining uh, Indian policies, but it did not have a single Indian member in that commission, in that board, all the members were British. And this was actually perceived as a, uh, as a humiliation, as an insult to Indians and because it implied that the Indians were, uh, were not ready to uh, decide their own destiny, it would be determined by a few British people. Now, the Congress party had uh, decided to boycott the Simon Commission at their session at Madras in 1927. The Muslim League led by M. A. Jinnah also boycotted it. When the commission landed in February 1928, there were mass protests and there were black flag demonstrations, there were slogans all around the country, Simon go back. So, the police resorted to lati charges as a way of suppressing the protesters and senior leaders such as uh, Jawaharlal Nehru were also not spared. In, La, in Lahore, Lala Lajpat Rai who was leading a demonstration against the Simon Commission was brutally lati charged and he died later during the year uh, as a way of succumbing to the injuries uh, that were sustained at that time. So, Simon Commission is uh, something remembered in Indian history as a black spot uh, in British rule of India. Next, we are going to discuss Ramsey Macdonald's communal award uh, in 1932. So, the communal award was based on the conclusions of the Indian Franchise Committee and uh, which was commonly known as the Lothian Committee and it was issued on August 16, 1932 by the British Prime Minister. Ramsey Macdonald. It intends to establish uh, you know separate electorates in India. So, the question of separate electorate became uh, almost uh, you know synonymous with the uh, formation uh, of uh, a free Indian polity with the formation of uh, Indian self governance. So, we see that the two things are actually progressing parallelly, the question of uh, the, the progress towards independence and uh, at the same time uh, an advancement um, in terms of uh, you know separate communal identities and thereby the question of two nations, the theory of two nations which is becoming more and more prominent with the progression of years towards uh, you know and, and, and this is the development that becomes the most prominent in the 1940s. The question of se separate electorate gets in interspersed with the question of independence. So, now we have separate electorates according to Macdonald's 
uh, a communal award for for the forward cast and for the scheduled cast all these legacies we carry till today for the muslims for the buddhists for the sikhs the indian christians the anglo indians right for the europeans and for the depressed classes that are now known as the scheduled caste. So, a white paper on the future of India's constitution was released by the government. The constitution proposed the creation of multiple Muslim majority provinces as well as the institution of parliament with different electorates. The Macdonald award was an attempt to purposely destroy India's unity by encouraging caste and religious consciousness or awareness as well as a sense of regionalism. It was a plot to divide India into several smaller states as a way of strengthening colonialism which had been sweeping the globe at that time. The British did not want any sense of national unity to be introduced since that would jeopardize their own status. The provisions of the communal award include doubling the number of seats in provincial, in provincial legislatures and creating separate electorates in Bombay for Muslims, Europeans, Indian Christians, Anglo Indians, the poor and the Marathas. So, in Punjab, the Sikhs were assigned 32 seats out of 175 total seats with 3 percent of seats uh, desi designated for women except in the northwestern frontier province and seats allocated to laborers, to landowners, traders and industrialists. So, through all these categories we have our sense of class belonging. Where do we socioeconomically belong in the in that ladder? As a result, we see M. K. Gandhi beginning to fast from September 20, 1932. It uh, aroused his, his fast aroused strong emotions among uh, Hindu caste leaders as well as among the depressed classes who came together in Pune, which is now Pune, in order to rescue uh, Gandhiji's life as well as uh, to vouch for the Hindu community's unity. Right. The Dalit leaders, uh, especially Bhimrao Ramji Ambedkar, uh, supported this proposal of a separate electorate for the uh, depressed classes or the scheduled caste people, believing that it would allow Dalits to advance their interests. So, we see that uh, what uh, Ramsey Macdonald's communal award yields creates a kind of tiff between B. R. Ambedkar on the one side uh, spearheading the Dalits demand and M. K. Gandhi who is uh, actually uh, looking at the dwindling power uh, of the caste Hindus. Right? So, if the Dalits were to uh, uh, separate themselves out from the Hindu identity, the Hindus as a community would further uh, have uh, their position would weaken which M. K. Gandhi did not want. So, Gandhi objected to the provision of an electorate for the Dalits in isolation from the Hindu electorate which in his view would weaken India in his bid for independence. Negotiations with Dr. B. R. Ambedkar had begun. So, negotiation between M. K. Gandhi and Ambedkar uh, which uh, resulted in the Pune pact in 1932. The Pune Pact was signed on September 24, 1932 at Yerwada Central Jail in Pune by B. R. Ambedkar and M. K. Gandhi uh, and this was regarding the reservation of political seats for the poor. And uh, leaders uh, such as Madan Mohan Malviya along with B. R. Ambedkar and others uh, actually signed this as a way of uh, you know terminating Gandhiji's fast. Gandhi had fast until death till uh, the, the Dalits actually acquiesced and so basically uh, Ambedkar and Gandhi uh, had a divide 
in, in, in their opinions, but they tried to reconcile and so Puna pact was signed. As a result of Puna pact, we see that uh, the, the, the pact declined separate electorates of course, uh, so Gandhiji had his way uh, to a certain extent. However, it gave increased representation to the Dalits within the Hindu electorate for a period of next 10 years. The pact marked the start of the movement against untouchability. So, it was a very significant moment for uh, Dalit agency in India, Dalit voice and uh, Dalit uh, you know uh, rights, the question of Dalit rights emerged with this pact. Uh, so, the, vo the, Dal the visibility of the Dalit within the Indian nationalist movement was marked with this pact, the Pune pact. According to the Pune pact, instead of 71 seats granted in the communal award, 148 seats, so it was more than double, were allotted to the underprivileged classes. Which it was an achievement on the part of Amitkar and his followers. Depressed classes would adhere to the joint electorate idea and they would be given appropriate representation in the civil service. This was another uh, achievement. Uh, this event caused Gandhiji to recognize the problems of the poor and the need to integrate them into the society. As a result, on September 30th of the, uh, of the same year, he founded the All India Anti Untouchability League, uh, later renamed as the Harijan Sevak Sangh and uh, also known as the Servants of Untouchable Society as a way of eliminating the uh, you know the, the practice of untouchability from the Hindu society. Next we talk about the Government of India Act in 1935. The Government of India Act was passed uh, on the basis of the following. So, the report of Simon Commission, the outcome of round table conferences and then the white paper issued by the British government in 1933. It provided the provision for the establishment of an all India federation consisting of provinces and princely states as units. Right? So, the government of India act divided the powers between the centre and units in terms of three lists, A the federal list, B the provincial list and C the concurrent list. The residuary powers were given to the viceroy. However, this federation never fructified since princely states refused to give in or to join. It abolished a diarchy in the provinces and instead introduced provincial autonomy in its place. So, the provinces were becoming autonomous as a result of this act. The act introduced responsible government in provinces, which meant that the governor was required to act with the advice of ministers responsible to the provincial legislature. And the Government of India Act called for the establishment of diarchy in the centre. So, however, we see that this clause uh, did not take effect at all. In the six provinces, uh, Bengal, Bombay, Madras, Bihar, Assam and the United Provinces, bicameralism was implemented. Bicameralism means a form of administration where the legislature is divided into two chambers. This was implemented in these six provinces. The governors were not bound to accept the advice of ministers. So, in the Indian provincial elections in 1937, the Indian National Congress came to power in seven provinces. So, the Government of India Act was a crucial uh, turning point in the history of pre-independent uh, India. We see that separate electorates was further extended to depressed classes, to women, to labor. So, all these separate identities become more and more concretized with uh, through the passing of these different acts. The Council of India which was established as per 
the 1858 act was abolished. The secretary of state was instead provided with a team of advisors. The establishment of a federal court at Delhi with the chief justice and six judges. Establishment of reservation uh, of reserve bank of India, the RBI in the year 1935 was recommended by Hilton Young Commission. So, these are all historic events uh, that are coeval with this act. And the act provided for setting up the Federal Public Service Commission, Provincial Public Service Commission, Joint Public Service Commission. There were partial reorganization of several provinces. So, we see this that the government of India act becomes a turning point. Right. Sindh was separated from Bombay, Bihar and Odisha were split into two separate provinces. Burma was completely separated from India through this act. There were introduction of direct elections, thus increasing the franchisee from 7 million to 35 million people. That is a huge change. No mention of dominion status or future concessions. So, the Indian National Congress unanimously rejected the 1935 act. Instead, INC called for a constituent assembly to be chosen based on universal adult franchisee for framing the Indian constitution. The acceptance of the role was challenged by Jawaharlal Nehru, Subhash Chandra Bose and the Congress socialists. They believed that by collaborating with colonialism's oppressive machinery, they would be able to achieve nothing for the common Indians through creating provincial uh, you know administrations at the through creating provincial administrations at the Indian National Congress. So, despite their restricted powers, right wing uh, pro office acceptance uh, politicians would think that provincial ministries might encourage beneficial activities such as rural and Harijan upliftment. So, they had some they, they were seeing some positive aspects in uh, you know uh, these reforms these changes. Jalal very correctly points out like many other historians uh, uh, that study the post colonial nations and that are partition scholars. Uh, she uh, notes that the Montagu Schlemsford reforms in 1990 and the Government of India Act in 1935 were responsible for the creation of regional particularisms. These colonial enterprises fragmented Indian politics in terms of class and communal manipulations. Uh, with this we come to the end of uh, lecture 3 and I am going to meet you again for the next lecture. Until then, thank you.